Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday, September 14th meeting of Plano West Rotary Club. And I am the president, Alex Johnson, and I am going to turn our meeting over to our amazing Sergeant of Arms and past president, Steve Watton. Take it away, Steve. Thank you much, Alex. Uh, hope everybody's having a nice day. I'm standing out here in front of uh, Audi Plano, getting a new tire, so uh, I'm enjoying the outdoor weather today. Let's get busy with brags. Uh, Cleavy, would you like to brag this morning? Sure. Um, I have my car back. I know I told you guys my engine had to be replaced. I do have my car back, which is awesome. And we are starting to open uh, requisitions for our um, interns, our summer interns, which is exciting. We've got a lot of new kids coming in and if any, if any of you guys know interns, I'd be interested in an internship. We're, we're open right now. What's the age group? Um, just request that they be in university. Um, we've got all types of positions and we're looking to hire 2000 engineers. Um, wow. Yeah. So do you guys know anybody looking for position? That's all types of engineers, system, mechanical, chemical, everything real quick before we move on to brags you might want to send glenn an email sure you can put it in our, our weekly newsletter because we do have about nine college students in our club fantastic i can do that thank Let's you see greek aisle two on here hey randall livingston would you Livingston, Randall, would you like to brag this morning? Sure. Uh, I guess, first of all, just glad to be here. Um, and I guess today my brag would be uh, always, I think I, I brag on my kids mainly, but it's really my wife that keeps the glue for everybody together. So I'm going to brag on her today for um, all the things she's been doing. Uh, my daughter finished up her uh, gold award for Girl Scouts. And I know it's all due to my wife's work. Nothing for me. I just Took her to meetings and that's about it and she gave all the direction on that so i'm going to brag on my wife today for that well that's awesome uh, no doubt about it with my wife nothing gets done without her support and me doing what she says to do right <laughs> exactly lisa leach would you like to brag this morning uh just i'm trying to think what to brag on I don't really have really much i'm happy that business is picking up um yeah fall season but other than that and it's getting cooler i know you're not happy about that steve but the weather outside is not too bad yeah i gotta make the transition sometime to heating so i'm okay um uh, let's see here i see greek isles one and a greek isles two on so anybody from greek isles want to brag um Yeah, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on all of us that are here that are enjoying food from Greek Isles. You got to come yeah. here. You got to come here and get some of this. This is good stuff. Absolutely. I wish I could today. Uh, Tara Bidwell, would you like to brag? Um, well, I don't have a brag, but I do have a plea that um, next Saturday is the North Texas Pride Festival. So please sign up to help us volunteer um, to help them have a successful event. So the sign up is live on the Rotary page. Thank you very much. It's 12.05, Alex, you want me to keep going or you want to take over? You have until 12.15. We are not inducting anybody. All right. Well, we'll keep rolling then. Let's see, Gary Busing. I see Gary. You want to brag, Gary? James Thomas, you want to brag? I have two quickies. One of the brags is the fact that uh, Benton's youngest son, Trevor Thomas, the tall six, seven slender kid 
actually went to Germany and Rome and he made it back to the United States. So I'm bragging because generally he gets lost and he doesn't know how to get back. Speaking <laughs> of lost, the second brag, it would be for um, Glenn. Glenn, I don't know who that lovely lady is sitting next to you, but she hadn't been sitting there for weeks. So I've been coming to Greek Isles wanting to see Michelle. Now, now that I'm not there, she shows up. Thank you, Michelle. I'm bragging on you. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> Anybody else from Greek Isles want to brag? Yeah. Yeah. I'll brag. Uh, finally, we're breaking 90. We went yeah. down and we're able to play golf again. <laughs> <laughs> So you just a fair weather golfer, huh? Yeah. I thought you were talking about your handicap. Well, are you kidding? My handicap's way over ninety. <laughs> hey, Miss Catherine Goodwin, would you like to brag today? Well, well, sure. You know what? I am going to brag on some some fellow uh, Rotary team members in crime. Last night, I sent an email out talking about how I. Wasn't going to make it to our meal drive through on the 27th this month and immediately got a reply back from Mr. James Thomas and Roxana, both volunteering to cover for me. So I appreciate that. That's awesome. Way to go. Speaking of Roxana, would you like to brag, Roxana? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, thank you, Catherine. I, I, um, I'm really happy to do that. And Michelle, I agree with James. I have been missing you, seeing you. So it's great to see you there. Very soon, I'm going to make it to Greek Isle because I can't wait to see everybody there. And uh, um, not much, just uh, cross country has been fun. Uh, the kids are keeping us busy, Dominique, with cross country. She's loving it, and meets are really early, so just keeping us busy. And swim season is going to start soon, so it's just going to get fun and fun. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's good to all. hear. We'll finish up our last brag. Uh, John Stafford, do you want to brag? I got two brags for us today. On the happy note, I want to give a big brag, shout out to Class 38 of Leadership Plano, who we sent off on their first road trip of the, of the year, and 36 new people that will be making Bet Plano a better place. And on a sad note, I want to brag on my friend Kate Garrison, who passed away a couple weeks ago when we held her service on Thursday. She was the foremost disability rights activist here in the city of Plano, and she made a, the city of Plano and the state of Texas a better place for people with disability rights by advocating for them as hard as she possibly could during her life. And safe home, Kate. Rest in power. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Well, on that note, what we're going to do is turn it over to Ms. LaShawn Ross, who is going to lead us in a moment of silence. Take it away, LaShawn. In a moment of silence? I'm sorry. I meant prayer. I, I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Okay. <laughs> you pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for this day and for this time. Uh, for us to be able to come together and, and work together to be able to further the service to others and to our communities. We pray that you would guide our thoughts, our actions, and, and bless all that we do. Bless us to be a blessing to our communities and bless our friendship and our fellowship and our work together. In Jesus' name, we pray and thank you for all things. Amen. Well, it's interesting. That was, uh, thank you very much, LaShawn. That was uh, what we call a, a Freudian slip. The reason why I was saying moment of silence is uh, a couple members had uh, commented that as our club is diverse, we have members of different religions, Hindu, Islam, Christianity, and those that are, don't worship. And so as we do a prayer, we're really 
disenfranchising some of our members. So I've asked them to reach out to Glenn Thornton, who's our chair of um, club administration, to kind of explore that and see how us as a Rotary Club can be inclusive to all of our members and not just those that are Christian. So I was thinking that with Sean, and that's why I said moment of silence. So I apologize for that. No problem. I just want it to be compliant. So with that said, if anybody has any comments on that concern, please talk to Glenn. Um, I, I don't know what he's going to do with it, but I know he's going to take it serious and we'll be able to put together a plan for our club. So we are truly inclusive because that's what Rotary is about and that's what our club is about. And next, what I'm going to do, it kind of threw me completely off. You have to bear with me here. What I'm going to do now is ask, I got to, all this Zoom stuff is throwing me out. If you know I've been doing it for two years, you think I'd get it straight. Jen Scherzer, please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Next, what we're going to do, for once, you know, we, we're not inducting anybody, which is um, rare. We, we, are, uh, we have a lot of wonderful new members joining our club this year, but we are going to do a special foundation moment. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Lisa Leach. Oh, Lisa, oh, there we go. Yes, take it away, Lisa. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Today, uh, I have the honor of presenting a Paul Harris Fellow Plus Eight to our fellow Rotarian, Kent Stone. Kent has been in Rotary for the past 26 years and in our club for about six years. He's also has been involved in Rotary at the district level as assistant governor and is our Polio Plus chairman. In order to be honored as a Paul Harris Fellow, someone must contribute some of at least $1,000 to our foundation's annual fund, Polio Plus or Prood Foundation Grant. These funds can be used to honor others while being applied to the amazing work that has distinguished our Rotary Foundation as an organization that provides hope, help, and peace around the world. Becoming a Paul Harris Fellow is a tremendous accomplishment and honor as these contributions impact communities around the world. So much good begins with these gifts, Wells are constructed, children are vaccinated against illness, senior citizens are afforded meals and services, children and adults are educated and given professional opportunities. This work is vital to the children, families, and communities who benefit. Only when people's basic needs are met can they pursue the larger elements of human life, including conflict resolution, community building, and peace. Paul Harris Fellows, in a very tangible way, provide stepping stones to a more harmonious world which we definitely need more of these days. Um, I'm pleased today to recognize Kent Stone, who has distinguished himself as a Paul Harris Fellow Plus Eight. Thank you, Kent, for using your time, talent, and treasure to enhance the lives of others. On behalf of the club, district, and our foundation's trustees, I thank you and I welcome you to receive your new Paul Harris certificate and pen, which Randall is gonna be bringing to your home. And please wear this pen with pride and honor of all the lives that you will reach through your generosity. Please join me in a round of applause for Kent Stone, our Paul Harris Fellow Plus Eight. I was looking, I was looking forward to joining and eating uh, lunch with everyone. Sorry, it did not work out today. I just had a bad evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. And I hope you're feeling better soon. For those that don't understand, uh, a Paul Harris Fellow plus eight, that means Kent has donated over $9,000 to the Rotary Foundation. And that, that's a lifetime commitment. And you know, Kent is the largest donator in our club, followed by Glenn Thornton and then Michelle Thornton. And so Paul Harris Fellows are very significant. We talk about the um, foundation often, but Rotarians like Kent that are truly making a direct impact, it, I can't even say how amazing that is and how proud I am to be in a club with Kent. 
And I've been fortunate to know him, gosh, what, about 15 years, I think. I think you were an AG and you were visiting Plano Rotary. And, the, and so that, that's, so I've known him a while. And um, I think everybody gets his polio update. That's also a, a personal passion of Kent. Uh, as well as the overall foundation, it's all together. So thank you very much, Kent, for everything that you do for our club and for the Rotary Foundation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Next for our member moment, I am going to ask Roxana, do you take it away? Uh, welcome to our membership moment. And, um, so um, Alex, uh, first of all, you have the club's deepest sympathy and uh, we are tremendously saddened for your loss and a memory of your mom will give you comfort and her legacy live through you all. And uh, God bless your family. And we're so sorry for your loss. Um, Thank you. Okay. Mm. So um, today I am very proud to present a very valuable, valuable member to our club. She is, she supports arts, she's a harpist herself, and she's passionate about knitting. So welcome. Joanna. I'm going to play something on, on my phone for you before I start talking to you about what I'm doing. This is not me, <laughs> sadly. <clears throat> However, it's the opening bars of the beloved Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy. Um, that's just the beginning of it. It's difficult to play on the piano. It's fiendishly difficult to play on the harp. <clears throat> but I still wanted to play it and our harp ensemble has a master class coming up. And my teacher asked me if I would work on Claire Loon for the master class workshop. And I said, yes. <laughs> it became clear to me that it was not gonna ever fully happen unless I did something pretty drastic. So what I did was, I don't think the people here can see it. I took this. Okay, that's what the original, you can't see it from over there, but y'all can see, right? Yeah, kind of scary. And I turned it into this. <clears throat> I transposed it into an easier key. I changed and left out things, but I made sure that the basic harmonies that WC wrote were there. <clears throat> and it took me months and months but I rewrote the whole thing. I may, um, once my harp ensemble uh, people are gonna kind of vet it, I'm gonna uh, deliver it around to everybody and kind of invite their feedback and what they like, what they didn't like, and then I may publish it. So, so that's my brag for today. <laughs> wow, we're, we're very proud of you, Joanna. Congratulations, good job. Excellent. Well, uh, that's all of our membership moment. Alex, next to all you. All right. Well, that is a great membership moment. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Roxana. All right. Well, let me go through a little club business before we get to our speaker of today. I do want to uh, remind club members this upcoming Saturday, it's the district round table. And that's when all the leaders of Rotary in North Texas get together and they meet in person in Irving and then they also meet um, virtually uh, via Zoom. Um, I'll be participating via Zoom. If you go to the district website, which is rotary5810.org, you can find the details of that roundtable. I encourage you to do it. It's one, it's part of our 
our new member orientation kit. But more importantly, besides for checking the box, it provides you the ability of connecting with Rotarians in the DFW area, seeing what other Rotary clubs are doing, you know, developing new friendships. So uh, I encourage you to do it. We, we do have members that show up either live or in person. So definitely do it. Um, for those that didn't know what Roxana was talking about, my mother passed away last Sunday on the 5th. And uh, my family, we've been taking care of her for the last seven years and it was sudden. And so um, what we're doing in lieu of uh, flowers or cards, we're asking people donate to the Rotary Foundation in her name. And you can use this link, uh, bit.ly slash rosemary memorial dot, uh, bit.ly slash rosemary memorial. It goes through our Rotary Club. And so then all those that do make that donation, um, it will be done to the Rotary Foundation in her name uh, towards the Paul Harris Fellows. So um, I do appreciate the kind words and thoughts uh, on, you know, for me and my family. To move on, we did not, uh, unbelievably, I think this is probably a first in over a year, we didn't have a service project last week, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Uh, but with that said, we have a number of service projects coming up, so everybody needed a break. So nothing to talk about over the last seven days, but we have a lot going on over the next um, seven days and more. Uh, we have the Barron Middle School uh, meal drive through project on September 16th. Sign up for that. Um, we have the next organized shoe drive where they, all the shoes that are collected um, are, have to be packaged together so they can be sent out. We do that every other week. Uh, the majority of those volunteers are uh, Plano high schoolers. So if you like working with the youth, show up. Um, a lot of energy, a lot of fun. Uh, we also have another uh, mill drive through at Armstrong Middle School on the 21st, which is next week. And then we have a cleanup project uh, where we work with the city, adopt a highway, we um, pick up trash on a stretch on Avenue K, that's on the 25th, sign up for that. That usually fills up quickly. And then as Tara mentioned, she's team leader for our North Texas Pride Festival. That's on the 25th. We have, I think around 25, 20 slots. Sign up for that. This is our opportunity to partner with the North Texas Pride Festival organization, which is a 501c3. This is a, uh, a great event. I can't remember how many years they've been doing it, but it's been over a decade. We had the president speak to our club a number of months ago, Morris Garcia. So this is our opportunity to step up and be a part of it. And I'm actually gonna be volunteering all day uh, as well. So I hope uh, other people sign up as well. And then on the 27th, we have a meal drive through that's at the Rallison Nat Natatorium. That's on a Monday. That's basically the city pool connected up to Williams High School. And then of course we have our shoe drive. If you know of anybody that wears shoes, has shoes, use shoes, drop them off at the Wellness Center, Monday through Friday, I believe between eight and eight. Uh, you have to look on the website to see the hours, but any shoes, people ask often, can they be you shoes? Yes, we're expecting you shoes. They could be men, women, children. It doesn't matter. They could be formal, informal. This project is part of an international service project that our club did last year. These shoes get sent overseas to um, third world countries. Last year, they went to Haiti. Honestly, with what Haiti's going through, I would expect them to probably go there again. But they go, what the organization we work with, they help develop micro entrepreneurs who take these used shoes and they resell them. And so that allows them to be productive citizens, have their own businesses, take care of their families. Well, we are using, we get paid 40 cents a shoe or pair of shoe, not a lot. Uh, last year, I think we uh, received about $1,200 for over 3000 shoes. So it's not a big fundraiser, but this year we're gonna donate it to the Rotary Foundation. As you've heard me talk a lot, our club has a big goal in order for us to, um, uh, to what we need to donate to the Rotary Foundation for us to receive 
a district grant for next year. And so this will uh, a little bit contribute to it. So the used shoes are easy. You don't have to spend any money. You just have to get rid of the shoes that you don't want anymore. And so those are all the different projects we have for the month of September. Uh, you see the links on the screen, write them down, get involved. And with that now, I'm gonna turn it over to our member of the day, Joanna, who is going to introduce our speaker. So take it away, Joanna. Bear with me, I have to find it, there it is. Um, my apologies for reading this from my phone. That's okay, it's great. Amy Lewis Hoffland is a, a native of Plano. She just told us she was a graduate of Plano East and she is the director of the Crow Museum of Asian Art, which is a preeminent museum dedicated to the works of China, Japan, Korea, India, and Southeast Asia in the United States. Um, I'm not gonna read everything that's on the, the, the board, but I did note that you have essentially been involved with the Crow Museum since its inception. Almost 23 years. Yes, yes. which is fantastic <laughs> and amazing. and. Um, when I was working downtown, it was my favorite place to go when I just needed to kind of breathe. Oh, it's very it's serene that. and lovely. And if you haven't been there, you really should. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hawk. Thank you so much. And well, sh should I go to the podium? Yeah, okay. might be better. Thank you. Hello to the room. <clears throat> Hello to the virtual room. And hello to Facebook Live. I realized we really are virtual. So I, I shared it very quickly and invited a few friends to come join us too. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so it's great to be with you. I am Amy Lewis Hoffland and I'm so honored to be back on Plano soil. I did graduate from Plano East and I attended Bowman Middle School. So that was fun to see the drop off happening there. Um, my parents live in Parker, Texas where a horse lured me out to the country. His name was Copper. So we moved from uh, Tulsa, we were, and after Tulsa, we were living in Dallas and moved out to be with my horse. So I'm really excited today to share a story of Asia in our region. And thanks to my co-captain, Glenn, we're gonna go to the first slide. Thank you, Glenn. Hang on, we're getting there. <clears throat> So it's really exciting to share a story of how a museum, the Crow Museum of Asian Art, became part of the University of Texas at Dallas, which is just seven minutes away, according to my clock today. And this co-branding here is really important to us as we honor our roots and where we came from as a cultural institution and as a museum and where we're headed as part of a tier one university here in our region. I'll frame the beginnings of our story with this uh, dated image. This is actually 2009 in the Dallas Arts District. You'll notice that Clyde Warren Park looks a little bit different today. There is now a building in that middle circle that is Museum Tower. We also have Atelier Lofts there just to the, to the right. <clears throat> but what I would love for you to see is Trammell Crow Center, which is the tall brown skyscraper on the right half of the screen. Uh, and our museum is located at the base. So hopefully some of you in our virtual, physical, and Facebook world have been to the Crow. I'm so happy to hear your reflections on it. That is something that we've loved being to the community as a place of refuge. And so this little part of the Dallas Arts District represented a much grander vision, we'll go to the next slide, of two people who are lifetime residents of Dallas, Trammell and Margaret Crow. He was born uh, in 1914, she was born in 1919. And I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of their history, but it was a very, very visionary thinker about our city. He wanted art and culture and international ideals as part of our life here in Dallas. We'll go to the next slide. And in 1997, after 30 plus years of collecting art from Asia, made the decision to launch a museum in the Dallas Arts District. The Crow family at one point had owned a lot of the land in the Dallas Arts District. He was part of a very radical decision in 19, I think that would have been 79. Rather than have a small district of just four acres zoned as Dallas Arts District trammeled convinced, 
um, eight city council members at the circle at that time to go bigger, to go larger. And at that point it was zoned for 68 acres in the Dallas Arts District. Very recently, we just expanded to 118. Wow. So the Dallas Arts District for us in this region um, is 118 acres. And it's property that includes cultural facilities that you know well, like the Dallas Museum of Art that started construction in 1974. The Dallas Symphony Orchestra followed in 1979. And um, after that, we saw the development of the, far, the further Western or Eastern parts of the district, including the AT&T Performing Arts Center the, um, let's see, the Wiley Theater Center and the Moody Performance Hall. So it, those are sort of the, the giants of the district in terms of culture. And then we can also look to our history with St. Paul Church, which was the first church in the area for the African-American community at the time, the black community. We also have um, the Cathedral Santuario and the Methodist Church. So it also has this nice layer of faith traditions in the area. And then we've got commercials that have come in, certainly um, Trammell Crow Center being among the first, Chase Tower, San Jacinto Tower, those were Crow projects. And in 1997, after 35 years of collecting and being literally a commercial resident in the district, the family made a decision to open a museum. And they handed over the reins to Trammell S. Crow, who's pictured here. He now leads Dallas's and Texas's efforts in environmental education through EarthX. And I worked very closely with Trammell for the first 20 years to incubate, grow, and launch the Crow Museum. So we'll talk about that in the next slide. So as we walk through that journey, we see the Crow family, Margaret Trammell first, as the initial collectors of the collection. Uh, in 1998, it was handed over to Trammell S. Crow as the guardian of the collection. And two and a half years ago, a decision was made to donate fully the collection the lease downtown, which has 35 years left in the lease, give or take, and $23 million to support a new museum on the campus at the University of Texas at Dallas. So the, the way it works is as long as we have a state of Texas, until Gabriel blows his horn, uh, we will have a Crow Museum of Asian Art, either downtown and in Richardson, maybe eventually just in Richardson in 35 years. But the guardians are now us. The state of Texas owns this collection. The students, faculty, and staff at the university will be in that first circle of care, preservation, and display. Well, let's go back to the roots. Trammell on the left, Margaret on the right, both uh, from near downtown Dallas. He was born and raised in East Dallas. His house was on Fitchu. Here he is in an apple orchard near his house. Margaret was raised in what is now known as, known as Highland Park. <clears throat> at 3600 Armstrong. And this picture has really been an inspiration to our values as an organization with compassionate hospitality. And so we'll go into the next slide. And she also had this uh, flair for adventure. Here she is pictured, this is one of my favorite portraits of her with several friends that I came to know decades later who she knew at the Hockaday School at the Belmont location at the time. This was at her farm, both sides of her family. When her father's family hailed from McKinney, uh, Colonel Edwin Doggett was one of the founding families of McKinney, Texas. He was the mayor of McKinney. On her mother's side, they were uh, pioneers of University Park and the first land, land uh, parcel that became University Park, um, her great grandmother actually her grandmother was the um, pioneer that came from Virginia with 30 people in her party. And at one point the well dried up and they had to move farther down into Turtle Creek to get closer to water. So this, this is what Dallas looked like um, in the late 1800s. Um, here we see what I call the first vision for what's happening at UT Dallas. This is Margaret at Hockaday. Um, the girls were asked in their class to build a museum and it looks like it, they are galleries of great Greek and Roman art. And we are part of a project that is called the Athenaeum at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'll explain what that is in just a moment. But she is pictured on the left in the back row, second from the left. And so I really do see this early appreciation of art as I study her, this early value of aesthetics and beautiful quality taste. Margaret was known for this. And so if we go to the next slide, um, she did have 
really a tremendous first 23 years of her life. Um, some of you in the room might know this ship. Anybody here know what this is? This is the Athenia, which was the first uh, passenger boat that was torpedoed by the Nazis that launched America's participation in World War II. Margaret was on the boat with 17 girls from the University of Texas. She was headed uh, for her European tour in August of 30, I think it was 39. And um, she was also trying to pick herself back up. Both of her parents had been killed in a tragic car accident in Waxahachie in March of that year of 39. So she was an only child. Suddenly she was an heiress and an orphan. And this trip was just one way that Margaret resiliently uh, moved into the world, having no idea that she was gonna be part of this world event. She was, of course, in first class as a woman of, of certain um, society, and so lowered into lifeboats, and she told me stories about how they just didn't even have time to get a jacket. They were literally lowered onto the cold Atlantic waters, passing around whiskey to stay warm. Um, but it was, you know, it was, she was grateful to be alive, and so she always held life as very precious. We, we talked a lot about how, how precious our friendship was, how precious um, having cultural experiences were to people and how being in the moment was really something of value to her. Here she is in Dublin just after being rescued. Uh, this is the suit that the Salvation Army gave her and you just know she's grinning, but that is definitely a grit uh, expression. So we'll, we'll keep going. She did meet Trammell shortly thereafter um, in 19, late, late 39, early 40. This is a downtown image. I would love to go and find this exact frame and contrast it to today. Uh, he was a bank runner in downtown Dallas. Uh, he didn't have enough money to go to college. Uh, he graduated from Woodrow Wilson. I think he also went to North Dallas High. I see both attribute him as a um, alumni. So I'm sure he did a little bit of both or something like that. But um, she's here, met Trammell, swept off her feet. And um, he was very intelligent a world scholar. He was studying the analects of, analects of Confucius. He was studying religious histories of India, Japan, uh, Zen Buddhism. He was very interested in the world, the globe, very interested in that idea. So we'll go to the next slide. And they were married shortly thereafter. She did have to graduate first. That was a rule that she gave, Trammell. So they were married. She held the reception in her own home, um, married at the New Methodist Church, which would be what we now know as Highland Park Methodist at SMU's campus. Next slide. Uh, they grew a family very quickly, five boys and one girl. Some of you may know Lucy Billingsley, a wonderful developer in this region as well. Lucy was the um, fifth child, so four boys before Lucy arrived, and then Stuart would be the sixth. Trammell is number four in the lineup. We'll go to the next slide. Here's a nice <laughs> image by age, but the Crow family, um, was very successful within its first you know, launch. Margaret had the resources and the connections. Trammell had this brilliant mind and he started out in the Doggett Grain Company. That was her father's company, was grain storage here in Dallas. And so he studied and learned about that part of the business and that led to a wonderful partnership with Stimmons who owned a lot of the land along the Stimmons corridor. And Trammell understood storage of material and how things are sold. And so as we go to the next slide, um, he really became a builder, catalyzed by her passion and, and love of his brilliant mind. So we'll keep going. And many of you know that he grew the largest real estate company, real estate management company in the world at one point in the early 80s. We'll go to the next slide. And his was a concept of innovation. This is the World Trade Center and this concept of a large central atrium where markets could be held and vendors could come from all over the United States, have little storerooms if you wanted to do off-market selling wholesale, but then also have the big market. And he also knew that all of these vendors would need warehouses for product. So that's where the partnership with Stimmons came in. And as early as 1954, they built the first warehouse in, the, in what is now the design district. Keep going. Intersections in history seem to be a really important part of the Crow history as I've studied it. This is November 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy, when he was in the motorcade, was headed to the Infomart. This is Trammell at the dais. 
letting the crowd know this is the Dallas Citizens Council on that day, waiting for the president to come speak at lunch, and uh, letting him letting them know what had happened, and they're all engaged in prayer. So it's kind of this beautiful moment um, in history. If you study the figures, you can really see a lot happening across the crowd, understandably. Go to the next slide. He also had this uh, tremendous skill for quelling tension. This is September 1989, following the tragic events at Tiananmen Square. President Bush, um, 41, couldn't travel to meet President Johnson and himself, but he sent an emissary, an ambassador, someone who was trusted. And I didn't mention that once the World Trade Center was built here in Dallas, Shanghai wanted a World Trade Center on a similar model, so did Tokyo. And so Crow companies built those two satellite World Trade Centers for those countries. So Trammell had the gong shi. He had the, he had the relationships. He had the ability to dispel tension and handle a very difficult situation. He understood the analects of Confucius that came into this knowledge of how to do business in difficult times. And so he's delivering the letter from our country expressing our United States uh, dismay at the cover of basically of Tiananmen Square, which is pretty interesting if you think about that. Next slide. Um, coupled, so his ability, his business savvy, his uh, thirst for knowledge coupled with her style. This is the New York uh, World's Fair in 1974. Somebody might be able to know that, but Trammell's in the upper left, Stewart's in the lower left. And I just, I really value her style as she brought, the style she brought to their, their partnership as a collector with an aesthetic quality taste for how this collection would be built, but it truly was Trammell that led to Asia. So let's look at that through a few slides. And um, here's their son who was appointed the role of Open a Museum Trammell in 18 months, in 1997. And so we'll go through a, a few slides of what that means. Of course, he's involved with Earth X, um, which happens not just in April with Earth Day, but all year long. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, the building was intended, the museum was uh, set to open in the Arts District, as I mentioned, here at the base of Trammell Crow Center. We'll go to the next slide. And the collection was the first challenge because Trammell Sr. believed that art should be everywhere. When he opened the World Trade Center, every parking garage lobby had a work of art with a label, with an explanation of this is Vishnu from the Pala period, with a date with an explanation. So he very was a, very much was a museologist before there was a museum. And in order to have a museum, uh, Trammell Escrow, his son, had to call on the experts to call through 8,000 objects sprinkled across the country. We found works of art in a hotel in New Hampshire. We found things in Austin. We found things out in California. And so the curator, Clarence Shangross, selected just 611, 611 works of art to be the Crow Museum of Asian Art. And so this is a B disc. This is one of the oldest works in the collection, dates to about 5,000, 4,500 before Common Era, probably likely used in a burial um, practice. And the, the Chinese believe that jade, which is what this is, is the stone of heaven. They believed it could be a conduit of the soul. So you'll see jade suits made of, or suits made of jade for the deceased. And also a B disc like this might have been placed at the uh, heart space of the human. Um, so we have we do have some prehistoric jays in the collection. We'll go to the next slide. We also have this beautiful miniature mountain. If you've been in the museum lately, you've seen this. This is currently in the J Room downtown. And what I love to talk about with this work is that there are two artists. There's nature that created the outer shell of the stone that likely sat in the bed of a river because it does have a high quality iron content. And then there are the groups of artists, it would have been more than one, that painstakingly abraded away the jade surface um, so that they could create inner caves and grottos in jade. It's larger on the screen than it is in real life, but it's about, about this, this large. It sits on a cherry base, which tells us that it was owned by a very high level official. So we can just tell by the use of zeton, which is that kind of wood, that this is someone just below the emperor. Um, much of the jade in the Crow collection is 1644 to 1911. So we call that the Qing dynasty in history. And that's a particular period of time that Trammell um, started collecting in the 60s. It was accessible. He loved it. It was um, 
lavish. And he also really loved putting works of art like this in offices because it inspired a work ethic. If you can sit next to a work of art that probably took two or three decades to create, what kind of what kind of employee, right? Do you do you get in your office? You get someone that is willing to think about how long this took. This. So we'll keep going. A beautiful um, seated Buddha that was once in the collection of Isabel Stewart Gardner. I'm just going to show you through a few highlights because what I really want you to do is come down and visit our free museum in the Arts District. I also want to tell you about the future, so we'll keep going. Ganesh, so there is also work from India in the collection, which we find is incredibly important right now with the migration of Indian American families to uh, this region. And we'll keep going. We'll just go through for you. This beautiful stone wall, if you've been in the museum, you've seen it, sandstone from 1750. Um, and it would have come from the second level of a, a palace. So it's a facade of a palace. We'll keep going. Sri Devi. And Japanese painting is also in the collection. So the large groupings are China, South Asia, which includes India, of course, uh, Japan. And then uh, there is a, we'll keep going, there's a collection. These, these are some additional Japanese paintings. A beautiful bell, which will soon be on the campus at UT Dallas. And I think as we opened our doors in 98 with those 611 objects, Trammell very quickly, Trammell Jr. very quickly said, Amy, I want to be a museum without walls. Let's celebrate the cultures and traditions. So Chinese New Year has become one of our most beloved signature events with over 100,000 people that weekend. This is 2018 at North Park Mall, our great partner, North Park Center. And so really looking at, as you look at art in Asia, you really have to look at how it was used how it was so integral to daily life. And whereas over here in the West, our tradition with art is to hang it on the wall. It's a little bit of a different relationship. So we'll go through a couple of slides. Otsukimi is another beloved festival, Japanese moon viewing. So this is a way that we've really connected with our public is through these um, large scale cultural experiences. Now let's talk about the future in these last couple of minutes. And Glenn just cut me off when, when you need to. Oh, we're good. We're okay, good. we're good, okay. So downtown, we've talked about the Arts District, we've talked about the Crow as part of 25 organizations signified by the yellow dot in the lower part of the screen. UT Dallas at 800 West Campbell Road is there. And then the Red Cross is population center. And we know that's probably moved up since this slide was made a couple of years ago. So we had always looked north. We knew that the populations that we were working with on cultural festivals and programs and lecture series and children's and family programming all lived north. And while it was really wonderful, it is really wonderful to invite them downtown, we always wanted a satellite in the north. We also needed space. We're in a small um, museum. Everybody loves a small museum, but it is small. We needed an auditorium. We wanted a library that might attract a scholar, you know, to come and be a curator with our collections. Um, we also wanted students. We've worked across the region with University of Dallas, with SMU, with TCU, with UNT, another one of my alumni universities. Um, I went to UT Austin, I should have said that earlier, but um, we, we were, and we even worked with UT Austin and worked with UTD. And so when they came calling, we said yes. So we'll go to the next slide. In 2017, we were invited to a conversation. The University of Texas at Dallas is now 50 years old. You know it as a STEM campus. That is a radical period of time for what has happened in Richardson. And um, this cultural devotion to the arts is in the organization's DNA. Margaret McDermott, Eugene McDermott, major founding families of the Arts District, the Dallas Museum of Art, of course. The Dallas Symphony Orchestra, you can go down the street and see the impact financial and um, the people that they've drawn here and knowing that if you're going to build a hospital like UT Southwestern and you're going to build a university like the University of Texas at Dallas, you have to have culture to attract the best academics, the best professors, the best doctors. And so the opportunity that is here right here in this moment, as we think about the Crow Museum and the other collections that are coming, is that if we look at the history of Asian art in America, we've got New York with the Asian Society, Washington with the National Museum of Asian Art, formerly known as the Freer Sackler. You've got the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco out in California. 
the, dot, the star in Houston is actually for the Asia Society satellite in Houston. Um, and then we've got Dallas. In the last 10 years, the Asian American population on the census has increased by 164%. We know the urgency to be inclusive to be knowledgeable and skillful in our uh, cultural fluency. And I believe this museum here in Richardson to be built by Morphosis Architects. They're the designers of the Perot Museum of Nature and Science, many other important museums across, across the globe. Our architect was just in Saudi Arabia last week. Um, but the building will uh, break ground next year. It will house the Crow Museum of Asian Art and the Barrett Collection of Swiss Art. So we'll have Asia, Europe, and the Americas. We have several collections coming of Latin American art. So we, we will offer the students who come here, the, the neighbors here in Plano and beyond, uh, the opportunity to see original works of art dating back to 4,500 before Common Era. So I hope that gives you a glimpse of where we're headed. The renderings will be released soon and really honored to spend some time with all of you. Thank you. A couple of questions if there's time, but I do see. Well, we're 12:52. We got a couple of minutes. So if you've got a question for the chat or in the room, are you still accumulating more information? That's a great question. Uh, we will be. Uh, Trammell S. Crow certainly is, and I hope he's planning to share those with us. Um, we will have an acquisition committee and. What this has done is brought some attention to the Crow. So I'm in, or it's brought some attention to the whole project. I'm in conversation with two families right now about significant gifts of their collections that want to help broaden what the Crow Museum offers, right? We are a collector's collection of one family um, and we, we, go, we go deeply in the area of Qing uh, decorative arts and jade, but how lovely to start to build beyond those collections. That's how Asian art museums are built. So there will be an acquisitions committee and uh, that once we formalize the whole structure of the museums. So not at this moment, but yes, in the future. Any questions? I know y'all have questions. So the UTV, where, where will it? I love that question. Thank you. So if you know where JSON is, Jindal School of Management, as you're approaching the university on University Drive and you come up to the circle, that first parking lot is okay. Lot M East, and that is the lot designated for the project. And it really will launch what we're calling a cultural district. So this will be first phase is a museum. Then we have a performance hall in the works. There may be another museum in the future with a large um, parking garage because we need a place for our students to park since we're taking their lot. Um, and a beautiful plaza between with very much the antecedents of the Dallas Arts District. This idea that there are interest spaces, gardens, public sculpture, giving the students what I've called this third space, right? You've got, they've got dorms and cafeteria life, um, they've got classrooms, but this is where they really will meet and connect, which is what an Athenaeum is. I, I failed to describe the Athenaeum, which in Roman history is this place of dialogue, discourse, and learning from each other. And so let the art and the libraries be the catalysts of cultural learning. Yeah. And what's the, for that first museum, what's the ETA or whatever? I would love to meet you there and open the doors with you in May of 25. Okay. So I'm telling the freshmen that are in my class I'm teaching right now, and I told them, when you graduate, we've got two parties. We have graduation <laughs> and we have an opening. So that's the plan, um, and I think, I think it looks like we'll be on track. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. Happy to come talk to other groups if there's anyone in the room that wants to take this story to their, their groups. And uh, extremely grateful. Thank you. Happy to, and just email me if you have questions. So. Amy, where do you park downtown to get to the Crow? Oh, that's a popular question. <laughs> Travel Crow Center is not hard. So you can enter on Olive Street, which is a northbound street. And they've remodeled, uh, now that the J.P. Morgan ownership of the building has done some beautiful renovations. So the parking garage is actually lovely. If you saw it in the past, you might not think that. Um, but the garage is right there. You come up into the lobby of Trammell Crow Center down the steps and we're on the right. Uh, there's also parking at Atelier, which is very easy, which is the new um, 
it's lofts, residential, retail, just kitty corner. So it's north of the Below Mansion on Flora. That's another easy lot. And there's street parking. And you can take Dart. And you can take Dart, <laughs> which is where, yeah. Great question. But the museum itself is free. Once you get there, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you so much. Amy, thank you very much for speaking to our club. It was great hearing about the Crow Center and actually your future plans as well. I'm good. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thanks, Alex. One thing that we do for all our speakers, as you've heard a lot, the importance of the Rotary Foundation is one of the, our global service project as a, as a Rotary organization is eradicating polio. So in appreciation of your time and program, the Plano West Rotary Club will donate $10 in your name to Rotary's Polio Plus Fund, together with the two to one matching funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, your $10 will turn into $30 to provide a polio vaccine for about 50 children. And we are just so close. Polio only exists in Pakistan and Afghanistan. There hasn't been any cases in the recent months. So our goal is that it will truly be eradicated. And that, that's been a 40-year service project for Rotary International and our partnerships with the World Health Organizations. Um, something that you might also want to know, Amy, is that Rotary, it's currently using its polio infrastructure to aid in the vaccination of COVID-19 because both vaccinations are cold, it's called cold chain storage it requires. So it's the same infrastructure needed. And because Rotary has this infrastructure globally, specifically in third world countries, well, we are part of that process as well because their vaccination rates are at 4% and there's a lot, a lot of ways to go. So you are gonna be part of that process uh, through this donation. And we just wanna say thank you very much for presenting to us today. Thanks. And you mentioned about freshmen. We, we have nine college students in our club and four of them are at UTD ranging from freshmen to seniors. So, you know, hopefully some of them will reach out to you. So when they are graduating, they're gonna take you up on your offer. Awesome, thank you. Next, I'd like to remind everybody next week, Abe Johnson, he's the Senior Vice President for Collin College. He is gonna give us an update of all the, the newest and greatest things that are going on. Now, just to let you know, we always would like to have somebody introduce our speakers that have a personal relationship with them. I personally don't know Abe. Actually, I originally was going for Tony Jenkins and everybody might know her and her husband Skip have been in, in um, Plano for years. Well, she retired again. And so she got me Abe. So if anybody knows Abe, I'll let Antonio know. So that way you can introduce him. I just know Abe via email, but we'd love to have somebody that has a personal relationship with him. So let Antonio know. And it's, as we know, Collin College is an amazing educational institute. Those, you may not know, out of all the seniors in Plano ISD, more of them go to Collin College than any other university. And so that tells you the impact. And as we know, PISD has the top education and that's where kids go. So it's, it'll be great for us to hear about all the greatest things that's going on there. Well, to end it, I'm gonna ask Mr. James Thomas to um, lead us in the four-way test. So take it away, James. Thank you, sir. Rotary Plano West, the four-way test of things. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build good and better friendships? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Rotary! Woo Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great week. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. Hey, guys.